Okay, they eat a bunch of rice, a bunch of carbohydrates, a bunch of soy. Why is the Japanese diet so good when it comes down to longevity? I mean, we have to look at sheer data here, right? The average life expectancy in the United States is 78.1 years old. The average life expectancy in Japan is 84.3 years old. Okay, but life expectancy, that's one thing. What about a healthy life? The average healthy life in the United States is only about 66 years old. Then people start deteriorating. In Japan, it's 74 years old. That is a huge difference. So why, even with all these carbohydrates and things like that, does a Japanese culture live so much longer? We've been focusing so much on blue zones as far as longevity is concerned that I think we've put the cart before the horse with some pretty basic things. So I wanna analyze the Japanese diet a little bit to understand what they're doing when it comes down to longevity. It's a very intriguing when we look at the research. Now, a lot of this before we get into specific ingredients and food and things like that, we have to understand their lifestyle just briefly. They walk a lot, they move a lot, Generally, they have stronger family values and stronger relationships, which are starting to really play a role when we look at the research. But let's focus more on the nutrition side. There was a study published in the journal Nutrients that took a look at 92,969 people throughout six large studies. Okay, so very clear epidemiologically uh, accurate data here. They found that there were a few really staple foods they wanted to look at. Fish, veggies, seaweed, rice, miso, pickles, and green tea. Yes, I said pickles. Now, they considered these the staples of a Japanese diet. Now, what they found is that the higher adherence to the staples, these foods that I mentioned, the lower the risk of mortality and the lower the risk of developing a functional disability. Okay, so eating a lot of these foods in a Japanese culture seemed to correlate with lower mortality. And that's a lot of data to look at. But here's another gigantic study with over 14,000 people published in the Journal of Gerontology. This looked at people specifically over the age of 65, and it found once again, when they adhered to these exact like Japanese staples and ate more of those, the people that were in the top quartile consuming the most of these nutrients compared to the lowest quartile had a 23% less risk of developing a functional disability. Okay, that is important. We don't wanna to get to age 65 and be dysfunctional and not be able to move and enjoy our life, right? As soon as kids are off to college, you finally get your life back and then you break your hip, right? That's not exactly how we wanna live. Now, there's some things we have to look at. Like for example, a lot of the Japanese culture lives in a mild deficit, specifically the Okinawans. One of the things we've noticed is that they live in generally like a 12 to 15% caloric deficit all the time. This has a lot of benefits, but I wanna focus on some very specific things as we move along. One of the things that in my research I've found super interesting though, is that the Okinawans and the Japanese in general have a lower decline in their sex hormones as they get older. Compare that to the United States or just the Western world, like that is a whole different world. Like our testosterone levels, our sex hormones like drop after like 40. They hang on there a bit more in like the Okinawans. So they notice that there's a slower like kind of aging and functional decline is associated with higher levels of DHEA. So the more DHEA circulating, the less functional decline there is overall. And it's interesting because when you look at studies that look at rhesus monkeys, they see that rhesus monkeys, when they have them calorically restrict, they end up maintaining DHEA levels for longer. So the more caloric restriction in rhesus monkeys, the higher the DHEA levels. Now, DHEA is a precursor to testosterone and other sex hormones. So very, very important. So what might this have to do with longevity overall? Well, it's very important because DHEA precursor to testosterone. Testosterone obviously plays a huge role in our muscle mass for men and women. And the more muscle mass we have, that's associated with longevity in multiple epidemiological studies. But then mechanistically, we have more mitochondria, we have more more energy powerhouses and we have more availability in terms of just the ability to survive when we get sick because we have more mass on us. Now from a longevity perspective you want to make sure that the muscle that you do have has good functioning mitochondria that are not dysfunctional. Okay, I put a link down below for a company called Timeline Nutrition. Really cool, they're a sponsor on this channel and I figured it's relevant to mention here because they use something called urolithin A, specifically something called MitoPure, which is extracted from pomegranates and it's a really unique form. And what it does is it helps support what's called mitophagy. 
Okay, so in this case, what it does is it takes the, allows the mitochondria that is in our muscle to go through sort of a recycling process to make sure that it retains its function and its strength. And there was a study published in the journal Cell Reports and a study published in the journal JAMA that took a look specifically at MitoPure, which is in this product, right? Specifically at MitoPure, they found that it increased endurance and increased strength in the legs, in the muscle, okay? But it also ended up improving mitophagy. There were mitophagy-related proteins that they found and they found more mitochondrial density. So it was almost like they were we're creating the adaptation that occurs that we would normally get when we exercise. Very interesting compound for people that are focused in longevity and muscular health as they get older. I put a link down below to save 10%. You can go to TimelineNutrition.com slash Thomas and then use the code Thomas. Okay, it's 10% off of Timeline. They have it in a protein powder, they have it in a regular berry powder, and in a capsule form. So that link is down below. Cool technology that definitely is of interest when it comes down to the longevity research community. So now let's look at a couple very specific nutrients that the Japanese culture consumes. First of all, sweet potato. Now we think sweet potato, we think high amounts of carbs, but they eat a lot of sweet potatoes and they also eat the leaves of the sweet potatoes. So they're getting copious amounts of fiber, but sweet potatoes are rich in resistant starch, which feeds the microbiome and is very good for that, which has signaling device properties and ends up helping glucose metabolism, fatty acid regulation. So a lot of benefits there, but they also get a bunch of carotenoids, a bunch of vitamin C, a bunch of antioxidants, and they're not just eating just the orange sweet potatoes. They're eating the white, the purple, the yellow, the white. They're eating all kinds of different sweet potatoes, getting all different vitamin profiles and different fiber profiles. That's a common theme we're gonna see here with their foods. A lot of prebiotic fibers, a lot of resistant starch. Then we move into the next one, which is crazy. It's soy. Now, if soy is so bad for us and destroys us, then why do the Japanese live so long when they consume three plus ounces per day of this stuff? Well, first, let me get this out in the open. They're not consuming hydrogenated soybean oil garbage. They're not consuming a bunch of weird GMO soy like we are in the United States. I don't have any data to say that GMO soy is inherently bad, but it's just not natural, that's for sure, at least not as much as what they're consuming over there. Okay, they consume tofu, Okay, so they're getting high protein content there. They consume miso, which is fermented with koji. Okay, that's a specific type of uh, bacteria they use in Japan. And they're consuming a bunch of natto. So fermented soys that are still getting the protein, but you're not getting the negative attributes that you're getting from like soybean oil with a ton of concentrated omega-6 fatty acids. It's just this, not the same. But interestingly enough, there is an extremely, extremely low dementia count in Japan very low instance of dementia and Alzheimer's. So when you look at a study that was published in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry, it takes a look specifically at natto, and natto has something in it called natto kinase. We found that natto kinase helps clear out what's called beta amyloid plaque, which is like the primary contributor to Alzheimer's and dementia. I'm not saying that you go and eat a bunch of natto and it's gonna fix your problems, okay? There's other situations, right? There's a other attributes to the Japanese lifestyle that play a role here that's very, very important, okay? So don't just isolate this and take it to the bank, okay? They're active, they're happier, they have tremendous gut microbiomes which might play a role, right? But then we look at things that we are looking at here in the research, like the ketogenic diet is actually pretty darn interesting when it comes down to Alzheimer's and dementia, simply because you're providing the brain with an alternative fuel source. So I don't want you just thinking, oh, everything else Thomas has ever said about lower carb and neurodegenerative diseases doesn't matter because it looks like soy's the answer. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just isolating the fact that maybe it's not as bad as we think because it's a different type of soy, right? Then they consume something called goya, which is a form of bitter melon. We don't really consume that in the US at all, and they consume a fair bit of it. Interestingly enough, there was a paper published in Nutrition Reviews that found that goya can actually help stimulate insulin release. So basically, it's helping them utilize the carbohydrates they do take in much better. Now, one of the most fascinating ones, and I'm gonna do a separate video on this altogether to dive deeper, shiitake, shiitake mushroom. Okay, now we know it as kind of a delicacy, right? But it's actually not a delicacy in Japan. It's something they eat a fair bit of almost every single day. And it has three things in it specifically that make it so interesting when it comes down to cardiovascular health. It has something called erotodin, which blocks the enzyme formation that is associated with cholesterol building. So basically, it can potentially lower cholesterol by stopping the formation of some cholesterols. Not all, but it's too much, right? Then it has specific sterols in it that actually stop the absorption of cholesterol through the gut. 
So that obviously would contribute to plaque, depending on lots of different things, of course. And then there's beta-glucans in it, a specific kind of fiber that has a bunch of glucose molecules bound together that the body cannot break down. So it is tremendous gut microbiome food. This is huge. Now there's a study that was published in the Experimental and Therapeutic Medicine Journal. Now this first study is done on mice, but then I have a human study right after this. Check this out. They found that mice that supplemented shiitake, okay, they went to the store and they bought their own shiitake. No, they gave mice shiitake. They found that they ended up having lower levels of liver fat and lower levels of arterial plaque. Okay, that's cool. It's a rodent model study. What about humans? So this study was published in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition, 52 subjects, Placebo, five grams or 10 grams of shiitake, okay? So they gave them this, and then what they did is they isolated their cells, okay? And they isolated their immune cells, and they cultured them. And they found that those that had the higher amounts of shiitake had higher amounts of immunoglobulin A, higher amounts of IgA. IgA is the immunoglobulin associated with the immune system in the gut. Higher levels of IgA mean A, you're protecting the microbiome better because you're having immune defense in your gut, not systemically, okay? So that immune defense in the gut protects our gut microbiome and it protects gut integrity and it prevents inflammation from really getting out of the gut into the bloodstream. So interestingly enough with this, they also saw a decrease in C-reactive protein in these people that had more shiitake coming in. Okay, probably because less inflammatory response stimulating from the gut via lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream. Protect the gut with the immune system there and keep it isolated there. Another thing they consume a lot of in the world of fiber is something called gobo, or more commonly known probably out in the West as burdock. Now this is super high in inulin, like comparable to artichoke, and they consume it in a lot of cases daily. So huge amounts of fiber. Again, we're seeing this link between the microbiome and this whole thing, right? I'd say the things that are most important, we got microbiome, mitochondria, muscle mass. So we're talking about the fiber that we're consuming here, the mitochondria in terms of like things like urolithin A, like I talked about for mitophagy, and then muscle mass, staying active and working out. But there's one other food they eat a lot of that I think it's really easy for us to get our hands on, and that is seaweed. If you talk to people in Okinawa specifically about seafood, the first thing on their list is actually seaweed. The seafood includes seaweed, it's not just fish. There's a study published in the Asia Pacific Journal of Clinical Nutrition that looked at seaweed and looked at something called fucoxanthin, which is in seaweed. And they found that fucoxanthin actually lessens the glucose and insulin levels. So again, for people that consume a fair bit of carbohydrates like the Japanese with rice and sweet potatoes, well, this fucoxanthin might actually help them utilize that better. Well, what does it have to do with longevity? Well, high levels of insulin actually inhibit something called FOXO3. FOXO3 is a master regulator when it comes down to longevity. It is a master regulator that helps the body adapt to stress. If I go for a hard run right now and I inflict stress on my body, you can bet your bottom dollar that FOXO3 is going to increase, triggering a response for my body to get more resilient. Same thing with a cold plunge or a sauna. We're upregulating FOXO3. High levels of insulin stand in the way of that. That's a problem. Okay, so if you can modulate insulin via different pathways with good amounts of fiber and compounds that affect insulin, you're in a good spot. I don't think we all need to adopt everything the Japanese are doing, but I think if we take things that we know are good, like maintaining muscle with adequate amounts of lean protein and combine it with the fiber attributes we're seeing in Japan, maybe you can really be onto something and stop being so egotistical and closed-minded about what we're doing right now. Be open to other cultures' diets because there's something we could all learn because we're out to be the best version of ourselves, not to just be better than the person next to us. I'll see you tomorrow.